Hello, and welcome to this session of the Herman Mountain Junior Ski Patrol Advanced First Aid Training. My name is Jonathan Busco, and welcome to Chapter 9, where we'll be covering wounds. You've already covered your primary or initial assessment of your patient and immediate stabilization, and you've covered bleeding or hemorrhage control. Now I want to talk to you about the actual wounds that you'll be managing. So there are many different ways to describe wounds. Open wounds are those where you actually break the skin. So you get bleeding from the site because you've injured the blood vessels in the skin and possibly in the underlying structures, the muscles, the bones, and the larger blood vessels themselves. You also have broken open the skin, and your skin is pretty amazing. It's this incredible barrier that protects all sorts of invaders from getting into your body. It's incredibly effective. But once that skin is broken, once that protection is broken, the bacteria that live all over us all the time and all over the world can get in and can cause an infection. So there's different types of open wounds. If you think about the most simple ones, you've got an abrasion, which really is your skin knee. You fall down and you take off the very most top layer of the skin. They don't tend to bleed a lot, although they can ooze a little bit but they're very painful and the reason they're very painful is you have nerve endings that go right into that top layer of skin and when you take the top layer of skin off the nerve endings get exposed to the air and they're very uncomfortable. In lacerations you get cuts usually from a blunt force so something strikes your skin and the skin splits open and so it's a cut with a jagged or an irregular edge and you basically are tearing open the skin tissue as opposed to an incision which is made with a sharp object either a knife or a piece of glass piece of metal or in surgery and medical care we actually do incisions where we use scalpels to open up the skin those are much what we call cleaner wounds the edges are regular and linear and there's not a lot of destruction of the tissue around the open wound you can also get puncture wounds, which are very deep and narrow, and when they happen, the bacteria on the skin and any foreign bodies on the thing that puncture you tend to get driven into the wound, so they're at higher risk for infection. You can get what are called avulsions, which is where the skin and possibly some structures underneath are partially torn free, but not completely removed, and these are more like flaps, so if you look at that ear, in the lower picture, there's an avulsion there of the outermost skin and the underlying cartilage is exposed, but it's not completely torn off, as opposed to an amputation where a complete part of the skin is either cut or torn off. And it actually can be more than just the skin, it can be all the structures underneath. So, you already know how to do hemorrhage control, now let's talk about some finer details of caring for open wounds. First, you want to make sure you're protecting yourself. So your scene is safe. There's no fire. There's no environmental hazards. There's no glass or other debris. There's no chemicals or other explosive agents. There's no electricity. There's no human or animal predators that could hurt you. Um, so you're protecting yourself in general for scene safety, and then you're protecting yourself from disease with exam gloves at a minimum and if you've got active arterial bleeding you may need a gown, you may need a face mask, you may need eye protection as well. You want to expose the wound so you have to see what you're dealing with which means potentially having to cut away clothing or other coverings from the wound. And then you want to control the bleeding with direct pressure. Remember in a wound it's not wounds that bleed. People look at a wound, they say, well, the wound is bleeding. It's very specific blood vessels in the wound that bleed. And so your role is to figure out where that bleeding is come from, coming from and apply direct pressure. One of the very common errors that's made in bleeding control is people will pile dressings onto a wound and then they'll pile more dressings on top and they may apply general pressure, but they're not applying pressure directly to the bleeding blood vessel. And until you do that, it's not going to stop bleeding. 
You want to scrub your hands with soap and water, um, and you want to then clean the wound. The phrase we use is the solution to pollution is dilution. And as long as it's water that you can drink, it's water you can use to clean a wound. And the more water you can put through, the better. When I'm taking care of someone with a laceration in the emergency department, I don't typically use the little bottles of sterile water or of normal saline salt water to clean them out. I numb them up, I put them over by a sink, and I turn that sink on and let them sit there for five, ten minutes cleaning the wound out depending on how contaminated it is. And that pressure and the volume of water are what really clean up the wound. If you've got a high-risk wound, or you're worried about the possibility of infection, <clears throat> you may need to clean the wound more extensively and then excuse me, have some other medical professional see the patient as well for further cleaning. <clears throat> Sometimes we have to do what's called debreeding a wound where we do more extensive cutting away of things. So use tweezers to pull out anything that's stuck in there and again use direct pressure to control the bleeding. Once you've got the bleeding controlled, you're comfortable that the wound is clean and you don't think it needs any further care, you can then cover it up. And we cover the actual process of dressing and bandaging a wound in a separate lecture, but the basic principles are put on a thin layer of an antibiotic ointment on a small wound, don't do this to larger wounds, then put a sterile dressing on and try not to pull off sticky or blood soaked dressings because what can happen is, at least in your initial first aid, you've stopped the bleeding because the dressing has helped to form a clot in the wound. When you pull the dressing off, you pull the clot off and they start to bleed again. If you have wet or dirty dressings, change those out. You want your dressings to be as clean as possible, preferably sterile, because again, remember you've broken the skin and so now you have uh, an entryway for bacteria to get in and cause infection. So what are high-risk wounds? Well, wounds with anything that's still stuck in it that you can't get out, a bite wound, uh, puncture wounds, although in certain first aid situations you may be the only one who can take care of those puncture wounds are very common in the wilderness setting. You just want to really irrigate them well, uh, get a lot of water through them and uh, dress them. Ragged wounds, so that you've got loss of material or the wound edges don't come together. If you can see nerves, which are very hard to see if you've never seen one, if you can see into a joint, so the elbow or the wrist, you see muscle, you see tendon. It also says if you see fat. Fat's very common under the skin. It looks like little yellow pearls. That means it's a deeper wound. It probably needs further care as well, but those other injuries are very high risk and so uh, also any wound that goes into a joint or goes into a body cavity is obviously very high risk because now you can put bacteria into places that are normal, normally very sterile. So someone has a wound, they've had it for 24 hours, now they're worried it's infected. So what are some signs of infection? Well the body's your immune system responds to any wound to help it heal. And so one of the ways that it responds to that is it increases blood flow to the wound site so that you can get all the good cells that help fight infection to the wound site. So you get some swelling and redness around the wound just normally as part of the healing process. But when it becomes significant, when there's bacteria invading and the body has to respond even more vigorously, you'll get large areas of redness and swelling around the root wound, and that's a skin infection called cellulitis. The area can become warm. That's the increased blood flow. You can start getting throbbing pain. Again, pain, it's a wound. You expect it to hurt some, but these become particularly uncomfortable. You may get pus, a whitish material discharging from the wound. Fever is a sign of infection. Swelling of lymph nodes, and those are typically lymph nodes closer to the body from the wound. So if you have a wound on the arm, swelling of the lymph nodes in the armpit would be a sign that there's an infection and the body's responding. That's what lymph nodes do. They help your body respond to infection. Uh, 
in the leg the crease between where your leg joins the lower part of your abdomen, uh, the lower part of your stomach, that's called the inguinal crease, and you have lymph nodes in there. And if they get swollen up above a wound, that's a sign of infection as well. And then any red streaks moving from the wound towards the center of the body, towards the heart, that's a sign of infection spreading through the lymph system. So if you've got a wound that you think is infected, what do you do? You want to keep it clean soak it in warm water or apply warm wet packs and what those that does is basically you're using the water to help wash away the pus or the superficial bacteria and the warmth helps to increase blood flow so that your body's immune system can fight it and all pus is is a combination of the white blood cells your blood cells that help fight infection plus the dead bacteria plus the debris. So if you get rid of that, it gets rid of extra debris. And uh, you can elevate the limb as well. You want to apply an antibiotic ointment. Again, smaller wounds only. Change the dressings daily or if they soak through with pus. And if the infection continues, then you need more advanced medical care because you may need an oral antibiotic or even an IV antibiotic. So there's a bacteria that produces a toxin, a poison called tetanus that can get into the nervous system and it causes the muscles to contract. People think of lock jaw where the jaw tightens up, but it's really all the muscles throughout the body are vulnerable. And there's not a specific antidote, although we can give something called immune globulin when someone has tetanus, which may help. Uh, the what we generally want to do though is tetanus vaccine and regular boosters and that way your immune system responds to the tetanus and protects you so you want to get the vaccine or the booster or possibly the immune globulin if you've never been immunized or if you haven't had a tetanus booster in the last 10 years or you should at least be assessed if you've had a very dirty or contaminated wound and you haven't had a booster in the last five years, although the recommendations on that aren't totally clear anymore, and you may or may not get a booster depending on the assessment of the wound. You need to get this within 72 hours to get your body responding vigorously to help fight uh, any tetanus in your system. So amputations. There's three different ways we think about amputations. There's what's called the guillotine type amputation where something very sharp makes a very clean cut and it goes right through all the structures. Uh, if you look at the finger there, now that's the patient's thumb, and that was a fairly clean cut. There's some crushing, but it's the whole thumb isn't destroyed. Uh, in a crushing injury, basically the whole injured piece gets crushed flat um, and mashed off so it kind of comes off in pieces and then in a degloving injury the skin is pulled away but the underlying structures are generally intact so it's like taking off a glove so you can get an awful lot of bleeding from amputations depending on where they are how far up the extremity it is and so you need to control the bleeding and do appropriate treatment for shock. If you can find the amputated part, you want to recover it and you want to take it to the hospital with you. Not all of them can be reimplanted or reattached, but sometimes they can. And so that's not your call to make. That'll be the call of, a, of the surgeon, to what they want to do. So wrap that part in some gauze, place it in a waterproof bag, keep it cool. Don't put... Uh, ice directly onto it. If you freeze the tissue, that increases the damage. You also don't want to soak it in cold water because that will also damage the tissue. It's called maceration. Now blisters are very common in the wilderness setting and basically you get repeated rubbing and the topmost layer of the skin pulls off as fluid responding to that friction fills the space between the top layer and the layers underneath. And so you can get hot spot blisters, so your pair of shoes or your ski boots rub in one particular place. Uh, 
you can put tape across those and duct tape works like a charm but really any tape will work or you can use something called mole skin or mole foam and you make a little protective area that's a pad that sticks out around the area that's rubbing and it's worth having some mole skin around uh, anytime you're going to do anything out of doors if the blister is closed you can put tape over it again duct tape and that will protect it and let it heal we generally don't open up blisters or try to drain them because when they're closed the skin's still intact and you're preventing infection it's only when they get unroofed that you expose an area of skin that's now vulnerable for infection sometimes there's tiny puncture wounds we just can't see that get infected and then we have to open them up but typically if there's no surrounding redness and it's not hot to touch and not extremely painful just leave the roof on if you're going to have to take it off wash it with soap and then sterilize scissors with rubbing alcohol to trim the skin off for a very painful blister or if it's open you want to clean it drain any fluid cut away the excess tissue uh, because that tissue that was the roof is going to die and it becomes a place for bacteria to grow under if you leave a, a margin of it some people say try to flatten it down over the the wound over the open part of the skin to make a, a covering but frankly you've got sterile coverings you've got antibiotic ointment just trim it off decrease that risk of infection apply a pad with a small opening to it to keep that area from rubbing anymore and then apply some antibiotic ointment and secure that area with tape if you get an embedded or impaled object don't take it out you want to stabilize it with bulky dressings control the bleeding and if you need to once it's fully stabilized if you have to cut it down to be able to transport the patient do so the sort of typical way that happens is somebody who gets impaled on a small tree or a tree branch you stabilize it and then you cut the branch close to the patient but you need to really minimize vibrations because you don't want to cause more injury by vibrating the object as you're cutting it if you've got an object through the cheek and it goes all the way through you can consider removing that because it's a real threat to the airway you do want to be very careful that you don't cause other injuries in the mouth so you put two fingers on the outside of the cheek and straddle the wound and then gently pull it out in the direction it went through if it were through and through both cheeks that would become a bit more of a problem but use essentially the same technique uh, try to get some assistance if you can and then put dressings between the cheek and the teeth and the outside of the cheek to help control bleeding if somebody gets an impaled object in their eye the most important thing to do is to make sure that you don't do anything that would cause the fluid in the eye to leak out because that's what causes ends up causing the most damage so don't exert any pressure on the eye stabilize the object if it's a long object like a pencil use a bulky dressing and then either make a paper cone or, or take a cup and cut a small hole through the bottom to stabilize it and then if it's short you can just do a small ring pad and roller bandage and you make basically a ring around it to stabilize it now the problem is the eyes track together if I look to the left both eyes look to the left I look to the right they both look to the right so you need to cover the uninjured eye to keep the injured eye with the impaled object from moving around now that's very very scary for the patient because now they can't see they've got an impaled object in one eye that's now covered and you're covering their good eye so you need to reassure them keep physical contact with them hold their hand and get them to medical attention immediately slivers uh, small splinters can be incredibly painful and very irritating and they always happen in very inconvenient places that makes it hard for you to continue functioning and they can get infected so you need to take them out if they're a problem so you can move the end of it with a sterile needle and then tweezers and in particular there's a really nice type of tweezers called splinter forceps with very fine tips that are really designed to grab and pull out splinters
then clear the air, clean the area up, soap and water, and put a adhesive strip or band-aid over it. If you've got someone who gets cactus spines into them, they can get an awful lot at the same time. So you really want to use a combination of methods. Use tweezers to, tweezers to, to, get, to get out and then put glue or rubber cement, not super glue, but regular glue or rubber cement in a thin layer. Let it dry and then you roll it and it'll pull the spines out and get them all out in the, or most of them out in the most effective way. And then you go back over with the tweezers and take out what's left. Fish hook injuries are very common, and what tends to happen is they get embedded part way through the skin, but not all the way through. And there's two basic ways to take them out. You basically push the hook through in a shallow curve, so you're kind of completing the puncture wound, so it goes through twice, and that's Generally, the only objection to this technique is you're now making a second wound, but it's a small puncture wound, and usually people do fine with these. You then cut the barb off and push the hook back through the entry and treat for tetanus if needed, if someone's not up to date. You can also use what's called the string jerk method. You can see in this picture that you're basically putting a loop of fishing line over the curve of the hook, stabilize it, and push down on the shaft of the hook so it tilts the barb up a bit, you're pushing down the shank in the eye, and then jerk the line out with a movement that's parallel to the skin surface. That tends to tear a bit more as it comes out. And honestly, the best way to avoid all of this is to fish with barbless hooks. It's more of a challenge. It hurts the fish less if you're doing catch and release. And if you do end up with a uh, impaled fish hook, they're very easy to get out. So closed wounds the ones where we're not breaking open the skin. You get a strike with a blunt object, but not enough force to lacerate the skin. But tissue, the skin, the blood vessels get crushed, and potentially other structures underneath get injured as well, muscles, bones, and nerves. You can get bruises and contusions, which are just black and blue marks. You can get hematomas, which is where you're actually bleeding under the skin, and you get a painful lump. And you can get crush injuries, where there's extensive tissue damage, but the skin, the topmost layers of the skin aren't broken open. So put an ice pack on, that'll provide comfort. You want to compress the area. You can use an elastic bandage and splint it, particularly if it's anything more than a simple contusion. Uh, you need to worry about an underlying fracture. And then you want to bring the extremity above the heart level. Interestingly enough, there's lots of good research that a lot of ice and elevating the a fractured extremity above the heart level is actually more effective for pain control than a lot of the narcotic pain medications. And so while this seems really basic, and it is really basic, it's also really, really important and good care. So apply ice and elevate that extremity above the level of the heart and keep it there. So what wounds require medical care? If you've got a wound that's still bleeding after 15 minutes of pressure, mean and that's pressure where you know what vessel is bleeding or you have a good idea where in the wound the bleeding is coming from and you're directing pressure on that site and you're not constantly lifting up the bandage to take a look at what's happening because every time you do that you disrupt the clot but you apply a good 15 minutes of directed pressure they're still bleeding if it's long or deep and needs stitches and we'll talk a little bit more about stitches or sutures if it goes over a joint because then we worry about it going into the joint if there's any issue with the eye, the eyelid, or the lip, uh, those are somewhat specialized repairs. If it takes off all the layers of skin, so basically you're missing a chunk of skin, or if there's an animal or a human bite because we need to do some other treatments with those because of the high risk of infection. If you've got obvious damage to a nerve, a tendon, a joint, or a bone, or you think there's a broken bone, in which case it becomes what's called an open fracture where the bone itself can get infected. If you had a significant crush injury where even though it may not look like a lot of external damage, you may, the patient may have tremendous muscle damage. And if there's an object stuck in the wound that you can't get out, or you've got a metal object or a puncture wound, those are, tend to be problematic, particularly in patients whose tetanus is not up to date.
and you'll need to call 911 if you can't control the bleeding within 15 minutes. You see any signs of shock. You've got injuries to the chest or neck and the patient's having trouble breathing. Any deep cuts to the abdomen, any eye injuries or any amputations, call 911. Those are even higher risk wounds for deterioration. So sutures or stitches, generally speaking, they need to be put in within six to eight hours of injury. For wounds on the face, which tend to heal very well, we can stretch that up to 24 hours. The, the good news about wounds is no wound absolutely has to be sutured. It's just certain wounds you'll have better outcomes, faster healing, less scarring, preserving function, reducing infection. One of the other really nice things about wounds is that you can either do what's called primary closure, close them at the time of injury, so within that six to eight hours for a, an extremity wound or a thorax wound uh, on the chest or abdomen or back. But you can also wait four days and go back, clean out the parts of the wound that, that have gotten dried out or have bits of tissue that were damaged and scarred up, and then close it at that point, and the outcomes are the same. So this is not something where if you're backcountry skiing and somebody gets a cut and you say, wow, that needs stitches, you have to call a helicopter to get them out of there within six to eight hours. If you dress it and they follow up in four days, they'll get the same outcome. Uh, ones that typically don't require sutures, if they're very shallow and the skin edges come together easily and don't gape or pull apart, those usually can be managed without sutures. Gunshot wounds are very problematic wounds. You get a laceration, so sudden force applied, tearing of the skin. You get a crushing effect from the gunshot, and then you get shock waves from the passage of the bullet through the tissue, and that creates a temporary cavity that collapses. So you can get penetrating wounds where you get an entry only, or perforating wounds where you get an entry and an exit keeping in mind that the path between the entry and the exit may not be a straight line, particularly if it's to the uh, abdomen or the chest. Unless this is an isolated extremity injury, patients with gunshot wounds are very high risk for deterioration. So you need to monitor their breathing and monitor them from shock, do your primary or initial assessment, then expose the wounds and control bleeding dry sterile dressings, and they need to be seen immediately. You do need to keep a, an accurate record of all your observations, and in particular, you need to preserve any evidence surrounding the gunshot wound, shells, shell casings. Don't touch or move anything until otherwise established. This is a crime scene, and uh, the law requires that all gunshot wounds be reported to the police. So that's wound management, and I hope that was enjoyable. And uh, if you're doing this as part of a class where I'm going to see you in person, we'll talk a bit more about it.